dear colleagues and students, I have a great pleasure to welcome all the participants of this conference where we will have the opportunity to hear uh, to Professor Jerome Brunner, one of the best known and influential psychologists of our time, who is going to make a conference entitled The Challenge of Psychology's Future. Jerome Brunner is an, an unavoidable name in the history of psychology, and I would like to thank him for having accepted the invitation to come to ISPA, the oldest school of psychology in our country, in the context of our 50th anniversary. Thank you, Professor Jaron Brunner. It is an honor to welcome you to our institution. I'd like to give a very war warm welcome to Professor José Linaza from the Autonomous University of Madrid, uh, who accepted to join us at this special occasion. Professor José Linaza, he will make a brief comment on uh, Jerome Brunner's work. Um, uh, later, um, Professor Antonio Novoa, Dean of uh, the Lisbon University, will join us uh, as he will, uh, is going to make a comment uh, on uh, Brunner's talk. Professor Brunner is currently a senior research fellow at New York University School of Law, and he has made a significant contribution to human cognitive psychology and cognitive learning theory in educational psychology, as well as to the history and general philosophy of education. Professor Brunner was on one of the pioneers of the cognitive psychology movement in the United States in the last 50s and early 60s. More recently, he has looked to the building of a cultural psychology that takes proper account of the historical and social context of participants. In his book, The Culture of Education, these arguments were developed with respect to schooling and education more generally. In his own words, you cannot understand mental activity unless you take into account the cultural settings and its resources, the very things that give mind its shape and scope. Learning, remembering, talking, imagining, all of them made possible by participating in a culture. This orientation presupposes that human mental activity is neither solo nor conducted and assisted, even when it goes on inside the head. Um, I will now uh, ask Professor Linaza uh, to make uh, uh, a brief introduction to Brunner's work, and then we'll have the opportunity to hear to Jerome Brunner. Thank you very much. It really is a, a pleasure uh, to be here, and I thank the ISPA for inviting me to meet Jerry Brunner again, uh, this time in Lisbon. I'd like, to, I'd like to, to thank Manuela and Antonio for a wonderful days here. Um, I could not comment on Jerry's work. It's uh, too much, 70 years, summarized 70 years or more is impossible. But I want to make a couple of comments about how I met Jerry. Um, I was very interested in the laws of learning uh, when I was in, in Sussex. Um, and I came across a paper about immaturity, and that changed my life. I went to Oxford and told Jerry what, what I was doing with rats. And he said, after three weeks, why you don't come to Oxford? to do this Luna Park thing you are doing with rats. It was early experience in, in rat, a, a bit less deprivation that we usually give to rats in, in laboratory. There I met a, a wonderful group of people, some of whom are today with, with us, uh, Karen and, and John, because what Jerry does all the time is to bring people together. And in fact, we need Jerry to bring together Spaniard and Portuguese psychologists in my case, for the first time. That will have long-term consequences, I think. It will not be the first meeting that we have. But in Oxford, those days, 
uh, we had wonderful Friday seminars. I mean, we had all sorts of people coming, uh, very good, uh, very interesting lectures, uh, but we especially have the time to discuss, to raise questions. It was a permanent debate. Many of these questions are still in our minds and in his minds. And one of the things he most likes is to continue these debates again and again because they are not easy answers for very complex uh, uh, questions. Uh, from those days, he developed a wonderful work with babies about perception, about language acquisition, about play, which is what uh, I was my little bit in it. But then he moved to anthropology, cultural psychology, law, narrative thinking, God knows. And we don't know what he has in mind for the next few decades. <laughs> 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 but I just want to thank him for making this possible and to thank all of you for inviting us. And I pass to Jerry to tell us about a very quite radical approach to psychology. <laughs> Uh, it's now been about half a century since the celebrated cognitive revolution started. It was the transformation of the human sciences that so altered our ways of conceiving of and studying nature. There's a shift around away from the simple notion of rewarding behavior and therefore causing it to continue as compared to not. The shift was in the direction now toward studying measurable behavior, but toward how we achieve meaning. What is meaning in our experiences of the world? And it's sometime without much experience. We've learned that meaning making depends not only on our natural innate capacities, but also upon the culture in which we live. It's impossible to think about meaning making without bearing in mind the fact that it is grossly intersubjective between people. For it is our culture that provides us with the pattern of meaning through which we construct our living world. Indeed, it's the culture in which we live that shapes how we utilize our innate capabilities. So you can't uh, really understand innate capabilities without understanding the way in which they're shaped by one's culture and the intersubjective requirements. But we've got to understand the complexities of this nature-culture interaction. We know now, for example, that this interaction starts very early in life. Even early cultural impoverishment can inhibit the growth of presumably, quote, innate intelligence. Without early cultural support, the innate capacity does not develop. Indeed, the debilitating effects of early cultural deprivation are strikingly difficult to counteract even by later efforts to provide cultural enrichment. If you don't start early enough, the door closes. We have not been very successful in counteracting that debilitating effect of those early years spent in poverty-stricken, unresponsive home settings, which I'll have much more to say later. All we need note now is that early cultural settings have a profound effect on later intellectual growth as well as later emotional growth. But in some deep sense, We've known this for a long time in some deep sense. But indeed, it's always been an ideological fraught issue. It's not, not easy to deal with. For inequalities in developmental opportunity have always been a major way of assuring the existence of the present political system. It's a, it's a technique for maintaining who is the boss. And still is that, by the way. Uh, what we know now, however, is that the provision of maturational aids early on must start earlier 
spend the school years and must take into account matters that are not usually included in school curriculum. Just, for example, the sheer responsiveness of the adult in the environment to the child, right, starting at around age two, a little bit earlier, uh, makes all the difference in the world of later learning. Now, I began by referring to the cognitive revolution, for it's transformed our ways of understanding the nature of human mental growth and how it may be affected. It also has ideological implications that I want to explore, implications that take us far beyond the behavioristic dogma, that we behave solely in line with the immediate rewards and punishments, the reinforcements provided by our environments. The cognitive revolution offers a strikingly different view. Human nature, it argues, is formed and, and, gu and guided by our search for meaning. Our mental lives, to use Frederick Bartlett's classic phrase, is an effort after meaning. But meaning making is not entirely a private activity. It expresses a shared culture that makes it possible for us to transform the overwhelming complexities of the world's input into a manageable, shareable form. In effect, we learn to chunk the world's complexity and somehow manage in chunking it to make it manageable both interpersonally and, and individually. There's this chunking process that George Miller and Noam Chomsky and a lot of other of my old friends have been talking about it has to do with the question of the way we think, make things interpersonally manageable. Well, we are, as it were, our own selves. We are, at the same time, members of a family, New Yorkers or Lisbon inhabitants, wives or husbands and so on. And our selfhood manages to create a workable unity out of this complexity. Oh, I mean, if I were somebody who came shot from Mars and looked at these human beings, I would say, how do they ever manage to hang together? They have so many conflicting interests. Impossible. But what is selfhood? I'm of the view that without selfhood, there could be no culture, that it's a necessary condition for culture, that selfhood is both a prerequisite for the creation of culture, and at the same time, a reflection of that culture. But before elaborating on that matter, let me return briefly to that so-called cognitive revolution, particularly to its emphasis on the search for meaning. To begin with, how do we human beings manage to cope with such a degree of complexity in our mental lives? The, the environment we create, here's an environment with a couple of hundred people in it, I'm supposed to have some sense of what each of you think. How in the world do you manage to do that without going out of your mind? When we talk about the magic number seven, you're capable of dealing with only seven things at a time, seven bits of information. We know from the classic research of George Miller and that famous paper of his on the magic number seven, which most of you know about, uh, seven plus or minus two was the title of it. Uh, then we have only seven slots, and we do so, we get things into the world by chunking them into those seven slots. So how in the world do I get this room full of people with this variety of faces, and some of you looking sort of neutral, some of you very sexually attractive, some of you looking very muscular, and like that. How do I get this all into one room? I'm talking to you now. Okay. Now, some of my early work on perceptual recognition makes it plain that we are well equipped with preconceptions that allow us to chunk. So, for example, when I exposed my subjects in my experiments back in those days, with pictures, a picture display and a gadget called a tachistoscope that shows 
picture for three thousandths of a second. I mean, faster than I can make the noise. Um, some of those pictures were quite ordinary culturally, others quite incongruous and culturally unlikely. Uh, so, for example, one pair of those pictures come to mind. In one, it's a picture of an athlete throwing a discus. I'm trying, you know, one of those shoo, like that. In one picture, in one version to some of the subject, he is seen with a newspaper photographer taking a picture of him in front. In the other picture, the, control, the, the experimental picture, he is there, but instead of there being a news photographer, in his free hand, he is holding a cello. <laughs> and totally incongruous. So they, my subjects in this experiment, they were Harvard undergraduates mostly, invariably misperceived and conventionalized the culturally unlikely ones. So for example, a photo of an athlete throwing a discus, but with a cello would be seen, not with a cello, but with a newspaper man snapping a picture in front of him. But after a few exposures to such culturally incongruous displays, things changed in a very interesting kind of way. Once our subjects recognized that the pictures being shown them violated cultural conventionality, they too departed from the conventional expectations and started looking for deviations from culture. Their guesses became less conventional, much more idiosyncratic, more inherently self-generated than conventionally culture-generated. Now let me come back to, to selfhood again. What is it and how does it develop? Puzzling. Philippe Rochard, in a recent book that he's written, I don't know many of you have seen it, he's at the at Emory University, the book is called Others in Mind, The Social Origins of Self-Consciousness. He offers an interesting perspective on this business. Let me quote, I wrote the foreword to the book, I liked it very much, but I want to quote from the foreword. Selfhood emerges as a product of inevitable uncertainties about our acceptance by a larger group, about how others see us, Selfhood is not just a product of inner processes, but it expresses the outcome of real or imagined exchanges with others. How do we relate to them? How do I relate to you? Um, so, in a word, to quote from him, without others, there can be no self-consciousness. Without others, there would, there would be no such thing as self. And others, is shorthand in my language for culture. Selfhood thus has myriad origins and expresses itself in many manifold ways and is by no means all of one piece. Expressions like, hmm, I'm of two minds about that. Do you say that in Portuguese too? Mm -hmm. I'm of two minds about this. Uh, speak directly to the point of the fact that we are very frequently in conflict about ourselves. In some deep sense, indeed, it resembles the self, a cast of characters in a play, playing out an uncertain dramatic script or torn between alternative scripts. So interesting. We, we each of us, represent an internal drama a friend of mine once confessed to me that he had a weekend self and a weekday self. <laughs> and that sometimes, according to his wife, he confused the two, <laughs> the, the two of them. And poets play endlessly upon this multiplicity as in such classic lines, I could not love thee, dear, so much, loved I not honor more two ways of doing it. And we all, we all suffer from it. And we all spend so much of our time 
trying to get it put together. So selfhood is not only a singular source of stability in our lives, if we manage to achieve it, but a complex of possibilities that, as Freud was so eager to make clear, are not always in harmony. It is no exaggeration, then, to speak of the drama of selfhood. Nor need that drama be in the split manner of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, if you know that reference. It can also be, how do we get along with each other? How, as my friend would put it, how does my weekend self and my weekday self manage to get along without irritating the devil out of my wife? <laughs> now, with respect to such selfhood dramas, let me return to Philippe Rochard's book on selfhood. Selfhood, he says, emerges as a product of inevitable uncertainties about our acceptance by the larger group, or more broadly, as a product of the doubts about how others see us. Without others, there would be no drama, perhaps no need for a self at all. That is, the self is a product of our relationship with others. Which raises the question of how do we form our relationship to others? What is that, where does that come from? Now, Philippe Rocha remarks in his interesting book, quote, the fear of rejection determines how humans relate to each other. Now, I think that's a bit of an exaggeration, but there's something to it. Some simple universal observation of how we live together and sanction each other's support supports the assertion that the fear of social rejection is the mother of all fears. Nothing is worse than the act of rejection of your peers, of being deliberately and systematically ostracized from the group. Universally, active rejection from the group appears to represent the deepest of human peers. That's the end of the quote. That was from Philippe Rochard, a little bit more strongly than I would put it. Rejection by others, in his view, is the ultimate threat to our selfhood. Our first step in relating to newly encountered others is to determine whether they are with us or against us. And in what manner are they with us or against us? And here, of course, the culture in which one lives makes an enormous difference. Note first that there is no known culture that ignores the question of what to expect of others. It's almost central to the definition of any culture that it defines itself by defining your relation to others and what your duty is to others and what their duty is to you. And if they don't do their duty to you, chop off their head or whatever the case may be. Note first that there is no known culture that I say ignore that. Now, the question of what to expect of others sounds like classic Christian culture even set forth the doctrine of original sin, which has always fascinated me. What in the world is original sin and why do we need it? That the others must always be suspect unless they are true Christians. And what's a true Christian? A little ambiguous. <laughs> um, other cultures take adherence to everyday routines as a sign of non-threatening otherness. If you follow the routines, you're not threatening. But if you fail to follow the routines, off with your head. Now, it's interesting. I came, became aware of this for the first time. It's a terrible confession to make. Reading one of my great heroes, Bronislaw Malinowski, the, uh, his book, do, I, I don't know how many of you know his crime and custom in savage society. Uh, he makes this cr clear, and indeed, they form these ritual kinds of activities so that they can assure themselves that there is somebody like them with whom they can share. And we, as I say, is this so strange? 
What do we moderns do? We form universities and departments so we can all be together. We have seminars so we can all get together. So uh, we form clubs, universities, fraternities, and we reverse ourselves that there are others who wholly accept us as we do things. So we're, our strength is our separateness of self, but it's the greatest threat to our lives. How does this all relate to the cognitive revolution and to the times in which it came into being? <clears throat> For revolutions do not occur as it was in vacuo. How did it come about? Indeed, the cognitive revolution itself was something of a response to the changing times. It wasn't known as the cognitive revolution. It was known as some crazy people like Noam Chomsky and Jerry Bruner and George Miller. And what, what, what are they doing? <laughs> like that. Um, being a woman or an African-American were no longer, when this time was changing, no longer irreversible phenomena. You were not stuck in a thing of that sort. It was cultural opportunity that mattered. And equally, if not more important, one sense of opportunity for improving one's plight in relation to others. One's subjective sense of opportunity and your willingness to use the resources of the culture. And here is where a newly emerging pattern of Western culture made a huge difference. So like most of the people in the world who live through deep revolutions, it isn't until two generations that we realize that it was a revolution. But we have been living through revolutions. The new pattern might best be called, I don't know what let me use the expression egalitarian constructivism. That is, everybody constructs their world. And one of the first overt manifestation was the so-called women's movement. At its core was the insistence that sex differences were not simply native and irreversible, but that femininity, so-called, was principally shaped by the role of women in society and not just by their biology, by opportunities provided them by the culture in which they lived. Even the so-called, quote, innate femininity, whatever in the world that is, uh, as in women filling their roles as mothers, was profoundly shaped by the culturally imposed responsibility imposed upon them by others. Yes, there might be innate femininity but without taking into account its cultural shaping, one could not understand innate femininity. Impossible. One anonymous writer even suggested in a widely but privately distributed pamphlet that the year 1956, the year 1956 was the annus mirabilis of the turning point that came to be known as the Cognitive Revolution, 1956. Um, and he gave his reasons for it that there were three epical publications in that year that indicated a new consciousness. One of them by George Miller, another one by Noam Chomsky, and another one by Jerry Bruner. That we opened up research avenues that forever changed the field by making us aware of what the sense of possibility did and what the culture's provision of legitimacy for opportunity. For there was something about those times, the late 1950s, the early 1960s, that precipitated, precipitated the shift away from mindless behaviorism to meaning-oriented cognitivism. That was a year of terrific change. It was a time of deep intellectual and ideological discontent both in Europe and in America. There was growing opposition in our universities as well as at large, focused in the academic world on the dehumanization 
of the scholarly process and our failure to recognize the human element in scholarly research. That even at your most scholarly, you still operated with a frame of reference that was not something that just existed in the world, but was something that you brought to it. Indeed, even natural scientists were becoming increasingly interested in the socially shaped mental processes that lay behind the so-called scientific method. I think, for example, to me the thing that made a tremendous difference, a book by von Neumann and Morgenstern that you probably, some of you will remember, uh, brought up this question that science was a, just a, one specialized point of view. There were lots of other points of view, too. And it had such a broad and scholarly but general popular appeal that it was even reviewed in the Daily New York Times. Can you imagine a book by two distinguished philosophers of science appearing in the New York Times? That somehow everything, including our most careful science, represented some relationship we had to our culture, to each other. <laughs> Not surprisingly then, psychologists also reflected the new spirit. Plenty of resistance though, as we know. Um, the anti-mentalist behaviorism of the Skinnerians came increasingly under attack as woefully reductionist. Why do you want to reduce man to that kind of a reflex machine? He's not a machine. He changes. One day he's like Jesus Christ, and the next day he's like Karl Marx. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was a period of turning in the 1950s. So not surprisingly, then, the psychologist also reflected that period. Uh, and anti-mentalist behaviorism of the Skinnerians came increasingly under attack as woefully reductionist. And interestingly, that was also the time when the new Center for Cognitive Studies was founded at Harvard as representing a, an approach where some of those people would come from the psychology department, but the psychology department was very Skinnerian, so that it gave them a legitimacy of appointment but said, you can get the hell away from those psychologists that make the pigeon pecking uh, the model of human nature. What a model of human nature. But note as well that those were the years that followed Franklin Roosevelt's socially and humanly oriented New Deal in America, as well as Leon Blum's neo-socialism in France, and the finally final toppling of Francisco Franco in your neighbor over in Spain. Even Russia was seeking to break away from the rigidities of Stalin. And Pavlov's reductionist reflexology came increasingly under attack in Russia from people like Vygotsky and the rest of it like that, some of the best. And it was very good. I remember I was a kid, uh, <laughs> but reading, reading that stuff and saying, Cheapers, I thought I was some kind of a nut, but there are people all over the place that are. Yeah. The Cognitive Revolution was, I believe, a reflection of deeper changes taking place in the world. It reflected a new humanism, a changing conception of human possibility. It has even altered our views about the process of education and produced among educators a new awareness of what can be made of the human potential. For example, to be personal for one, I'm stunned by the fact that a book of mine called The Process of Education that attempted to bring the new cognitive revolution to bear on educational problems has been translated into more than a dozen languages and has sold hundreds of thousands of copies. And I, the, the, the Harvard University Press, which originally brought the thing out, uh, had absolutely no idea that, that a, a book on education by a university professor would sell uh, a half a million copies. So what they had to do during that period was keep reprinting. The original edition that the, the press published at that point was 5,000 copies. <laughs> 
the 5,000 copies were sold within the first two weeks that the book appeared. And all of us were wondering, what the hell is going on here? Oh, this is amazing. Something is changing. Well, the world is changing, and the cognitive revolution is an expression of that change. That is to say, we no longer take it for granted that all you've got to do is to get people to behave and reward them, and that's all there is to it. They make meaning. They form some sense of the culture. We cannot have a psychology without culture, and a cultural anthropologists cannot have culture without psychology, that there's some way in which these ancient divisions into psychology, history, anthropology, sociology, Qu'est-ce qu'on doit faire avec ça? Is it French? I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense anymore. And the cognitive revolution is an expression of that change. After all, culture and the human sciences have to live on the same street. And education is right on that same street as well. Uh, we have much to look forward to, including lots of battles. We know that the human mental, that human mental functioning is dependent not only upon our individual powers, but upon the means for expressing them provided by the culture, that the culture provides the sense of the realization of our capacities. We cannot live without it. Well, so there I am. Uh, my lady read, um, an earlier draft of this paper. She is a, she's a law professor. Uh, and uh, she said, I think you're going through a new phase, darling. <laughs> <laughs> and she may be right. Uh, but you know Eleanor, she's, uh, she's not a psychologist, but uh, she works in a field where there are lots of psychological and cultural things that matter as to what constitutes monopoly, for example. So she sees me as going through a change. And I see us all going through a change. And I'm, I took this opportunity, knowing I was going to be here in Lisbon, not having been here for several years, to see what I can make of where is this going. And it's mostly going in the direction of opening our minds, and, and some people closing some minds, too. But, uh, <laughs> that's bound to do that. Yeah, and I'd love to hear your reactions to this, and see whether I'm reacting. Thank you very much. Just a, just a very brief word. It's indeed a pleasure to, to be here. And thank you very much for the invitation of HISPA and for inviting me to share with you some, uh, some ideas from the field of education, because I'm from education and not from psychology. But it's indeed a pleasure to be here and to uh, listen to you, to read uh, your books for a long, long time, to share your ideas with many of my friends and with many of my colleagues and it's a pleasure to have uh, this presence and this freedom of thinking this, uh, uh, which is uh, so important for us in these times that are also difficult times in Portugal as you know, in Europe as you know and uh, we need the people that think uh, freely and that can help us in, uh, in um, in fostering new understandings about uh, uh, our culture and our education. If I, I, I say it to my, to my students very, very, uh, very often, that I am not, and mainly I think that you are not what uh, in French uh, a psychopedagogue, a Belgian psychopedagogue of the beginning of the 20th century called an SSS. And an SSS in French 
is a specialist, specialement spécialisé. No? Uh, I think <laughs> I think that we don't need SSS. We need people that are able of thinking in a much broader uh, ideas and uh, fostering uh, new understandings about about the world. And I mainly, if I can, uh, underline. Um, three ideas of what I learned uh, from you throughout the years. I would, I would probably underline uh, uh, three ideas that are very important for me in education, but also in my work at the university. The first one is the idea of education as an act of culture. Yeah. As an act of culture. And so, uh, not uh, as something that inscribes us in a culture, but as something that produces culture in the process uh, of doing an educational process. And this idea of culture, of creation, of knowledge creation, is in my idea central for education and it's central for universities. And I think that you help us in trying to connect mainly inside universities in which is related with this kind of division that we often do between research and teaching and trying to understand that there are no division between these two activities and it cannot be and it, this knowledge creation is the way of teaching is in this process of creating knowledge and this connection between these two times. I think... Not only creating knowledge, but also creating good questions. Yes. <laughs> Asking good questions yeah. and, uh, of course, that, that was for me uh, uh, a very important uh, uh, thing that I learned from your works. The second one, and you have underlined it in, uh, uh, in your, uh, in your uh, answers now, it's about questions of relation and uh, the idea how we, you need to build uh, a freedom of relation, a freedom in the way of you connect with people. And now in this process, it's not only an institutionalized process, but it's a more open process. And that education cannot be done without this process of connecting each other and trying to build this relation. And I think that it's very, very important no, in the things that I learned with you for a long, long time. And the third one, I've, I've been discussing it for a long time with uh, a professor here at ISPA. I don't know if it's around, probably not. Uh, no. <laughs> no. Sergio Niza. Sergio Niza is a very, very good friend and probably Sergio Niza is a Portuguese educator, probably the most important Portuguese educator nowadays and he is professor here in, in ISPA, in this institute. And he wrote uh, a very brief phrase one day, and I believe that this phrase uh, came out of some discussions that we have in a kind of informal seminar, discussing also your works. And the phrase that I like very much is, ethics, pedagogy, and democracy are exactly the same thing. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I believe that dealing with questions of curiosity and courage, dealing with questions of values, dealing with the questions of the consequences of our work in terms of society is absolutely central in this beginning of the 20, 21st century. But it's a bit, just, to, just to say one thing in parenthesis, the influence is itself interesting because the culture itself as a kind of structure resisting too mm. much change. Yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> of course. What we say is, that's very interesting, go away. <laughs> <laughs> and that were the three things that I would like to share with you and with the audience, saying that it's really an honor to be here in this moment and to have the opportunity to meet with you. It's wonderful. I have a, a great deal of respect and of admiration for your work. And I think I want to give you all my congratulations and also to East for organizing this wonderful journey 
on your homage and, and you know, and thank you very much. Thank you.